Uh, we are now being recorded and let's get our session started. So welcome everyone. Um, thank you for taking a little time out of your day, whether it's the, your morning like it is here in um, sunny Seattle. No, really it's cold, wet and windy here as per usual. <laughs> kind of like the picture you sent me the other day, Kent, of, over <laughs> yep. there. Yes. Um, but it's a great day anyway. So whether it's morning for you, afternoon, evening, whatever it is, I know it like it is for Kent. I'm glad you take some time out of your day to come and listen to his chat. Um, this session is um, t entitled, In Case You Missed It, Microsoft Ignite Recap and Some New Stuff. So we know not everybody in the world had the opportunity of making it down to Atlanta for Ignite, although whatever it was, 23,000 of our friends did make it there. Um, and even if you did make it, you certainly couldn't have hit everything that you wanted to hit there since it was a massive um, environment there. So what we wanted to do is just have a little recap session on, on what we heard um, between Kent and myself in the environment you guys would be concerned about, being configuration manager and enterprise mobility and security, and just talk about that and then a couple things we've heard since the event in, in Atlanta at night. So um, for those of you who aren't aware, my name is Wally Mead. I'm a principal program manager at Cyrison. Been here for two and a half years after 22 years at Microsoft working in the SMS and configuration manager product group. Uh, my contact details are on the slide as well as our general email alias and website for Cyrison. Kent, if you want to introduce yourself. Yeah. Absolutely. So my name is uh, Kent and right now I'm working out of Copenhagen in Denmark where it's it's getting dark. <laughs> uh, uh, I've been working for uh, Cortec Global uh, for about 17 years, uh, primarily with uh, enterprise client management. Been working with SMS configuration manager for 20 years and uh, mobile device management for about uh, four or five years by now. Um, and as uh, Wally said, well, we're kind of super excited to present to you what you know some of the stuff we met at at Ignite and and also some uh, some new stuff here. Yeah, and you've been an MVP for how many years now, Kent? Uh, six or seven. Six I or think. seven. Yeah, yeah, way longer yeah. than me. But um, so yeah, I got a couple hopefully smart people here to help guide you through some of this information that uh, you may not have been able to see before. So. Just a couple little housekeeping, oh, there we go, housekeeping things. Um, we are being recorded, um, not that you guys are unmuted and you can't talk anyway, but um, um, so the session will be recorded and it will be up on our Vimeo site. So you can go to vimeo.com slash team Cyrusen, one word. Uh, probably later on this week, Friday, my guess is Melanie will have this posted up there if you want to listen to it again, if you want to watch some of the demos we did again or our... Um, you were confused by something we said. Hopefully our, our goal here is to unconfuse you about some of the things you might have heard. So anyway, there, it is being recorded. Um, there, You do have the ability of, of asking questions. So you can go to the Q&A panel there and ask questions. I normally don't look at them throughout the webinar because it can it distracts me having those available. So um, normally I'm not going to look at it until the end. So if you do ask questions throughout, I would ask you to put a little context around your question. Just don't say, why is that? Well, by the time I get to that at the end, I'm not going to know what why is that you're asking about. So, <laughs> so put a little context there, and that'll help out a lot. So, and we will cover those um, um, later on for you. So, with that, our agenda for today is to start off with who we are as uh, our two individual companies, Cyrus and Cortec, and then the meat of the presentation is going to be a recap of the news that we heard at Microsoft Ignite, and the few weeks it's been since Ignite, because um, some additional things have come out um, that are relevant to you guys since then. So we want to talk about the System Center 2016 release and how it impacts Configuration Manager. Um, Kent's going to talk about some updates in the enterprise mobility and security area, so mobile devices he was talking about, and then. We're going to talk about Technical Preview 1609 as potential updates that might impact your production environment when the next production build of current branch becomes available. Um, and there's something, one big change in there that you guys need to be aware of and be prepared for when it does impact you. So with that, um, Cyrusen, uh, you guys have seen me do these slides before. Um, we're a software and services company around System Center. And we do um, software and services around service management, so taking service manager and making it a more usable platform for you and providing some workarounds and enhancements for some of those limitations in service manager on the end user and, as well as admin side. Asset management, allowing you to pull asset data from configuration manager, operations manager, active directory, putting it into a CMDB that you can then enhance that 
with additional financial, technical, business, um, contractual data that you want for your true lifecycle management. Password reset. Um, you guys all have help desk staff, which gets bombarded with, um, hey, I forgot my password type calls. Well, this is a self-service scenario where users can reset their own password through Active Directory, including integration with the logon, when logon screen. We have consulting services if needed. If one of our partners, such as Cortec, can't handle it um, or need additional assistance, we can go ahead and, and fill the, those gaps for you. And then the partner community enablement team, which is the team I'm on, we help do training, um, solicit feedback on products to know what new products to develop and features and products and so on. Our Cyrus and platform sits on top of System Center. Um, primarily in the area I work in is, is configuration manager, but as just mentioned, we do a lot in service manager. So sitting on top of System Center, which can be an on-premise solution or it can be a cloud-based solution, whatever is your preference. Although we think there's advantages to the um, Azure-based um, cloud scenario for a lot of the management features. And just lastly for me, our Cyrus and platform, we have an all-encompassing suite called the Business Management Solution, which gets you the service management, those end user type capabilities, including our self-service portal for service manager, the essentials management more for the analyst and administrator um, functionality from service manager, and then the asset management technology I talked about prior. We also have the password reset for Active Directory solution I discussed. And then where most of the stuff that I work on falls into is in the free community apps. And we have four free apps for um, configuration manager, as well as I think it's eight for service manager that you can just go up to our Cyrus website and download all those free of charge and start playing around. With that, Mr. Kent. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it's not every day you'll hear Wally and, and me give a kind of a sales pitch at the same, the same session, but uh, we, we do that now. So I, I work for Cortec Global and uh, just like Cyrus, and, uh, our focus is also on System Center and the, the cloud platform. Um, me personally, I work uh, in the enterprise client management space, but I also have a lot of colleagues who are working in the, uh, in the data center space, uh, a lot of uh, service manager. Uh, focus there and, and, and Azure Pack and automation. Um, and we are 30 people and we, we do have offices, uh, four offices in Europe and a couple of offices in the States. So we mainly operate uh, in Europe and in the States, but uh, I would say that the system center seems to be global. So um, just like Wally, I've been all around the world. Um, we are eight MEPs and not seven, uh, so that number just updated, which is which is nice. Uh, and and the MEPs, my colleagues here are MEPs in, in cloud and data center, and then I have uh, five colleagues who are enterprise mobility MEPs. And just just like Cyrus, and we also uh, we also have a lot of freeware products that you can download from our blog, and we also have a uh, a dashboard as a service. Uh, and, and, and right now it's, uh, it's a configuration manager dashboard that will allow you to visualize all of your config manager data. Uh, primarily our customers are using that to track uh, compliance, that, that be compliance in, uh, in patch management, but also compliance in server health and, and, and client health and so on and so forth. But it's, it's all the data that you, uh, you can put into config manager that, that we can visualize that way. Yeah, and Cortec is one of our great partners, so we um, absolutely love working with those guys and, and really appreciate the fact that they've expanded to the U.S., which is um, where I am, um, although we have global reach as well. So, And as Kent said, you don't normally hear us doing sales stuff, so we're done with that. So now we're going to get into the technical stuff. So, um, so the, <laughs> the first topic of our conversation today is System Center 2016. So we're, we're going to tell you now is what we heard Microsoft say at Ignite and a couple things we've learned since Ignite, because um, honestly, at Ignite, they didn't really say a whole lot. So at Ignite, Microsoft announced the availability of System Center 2016. Um, so they didn't really talk about System Center a whole lot there. Um, I didn't find very many configuration manager sessions myself. Um, and I know every time I walk by, my, the Microsoft presence there obviously was huge. Um, they took up like, seemed like a half the exhibit floor was a Microsoft booth uh, with hundreds of different pods you could go to. Um, whenever I walked by the um, area where Kent and I would be interested in, the um, Intune configuration manager type space, I saw only one person that I knew there from the product group. 
I believe, Kent, you said you were there helping answer questions since they couldn't find many configuration manager people there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I believe that was out of the kindness of your heart, not probably not scheduled. But um, um, so, yeah, the, it, although Microsoft had a great presence there um, and they did talk a little bit about System Center, it wasn't really a whole lot of meat to it. So all they really announced, again, was the availability of System Center 2016. They talked a little bit about how it related to or how it could be used to manage Windows Server 2016 and did a little bit about here some of the features that are coming in the with the 2016 product. Um, with that, again, the whenever they talked about System Center 2016 as a whole, they pretty well ignored Configuration Manager since obviously Configuration Manager has been out many, many, many more years prior to any of the other System Center products. And even though System Center er, it's, includes Configuration Manager, it also is a separate technology you can purchase. So now what they announced the, with the availability was only preview versions of all of the System Center products or most of the System Center products. It wasn't RTM yet. They had not, they did not announce the general availability of the suite. They was just the preview capabilities. So a couple of weeks after Ignite, it was actually on Wednesday, October 12th, when Kent and I were in Las Vegas last week at um, IT Dev Connections, the Microsoft announced the general availability of System Center 2016. So the general availability is when you guys have the ability of going to the Volume License Servicing Center or MSDN or the Tech Evaluation, Tech Center Evaluation Center, and downloading the, the finished versions of those products. So the general availability means these products are generally available for everybody to go ahead and download through whatever their appropriate medium is and start implementing those as per appropriate license agreements. So um, as part of System Center 2016, there is a new version of Configuration Manager, or there is a version of Configuration Manager, not necessarily a new version. So Configuration Manager build is included in System Center 2016. However, it is not Configuration <laughs> Manager 2016. We get that all the time. People are always asking, when's, what's in Configuration Manager 2016? And there is no Configuration Manager 2016 product. So as you've heard me tout in every single webinar I've done on Configuration Manager since current branch came out, and I was stating that the product name is just System Center Configuration Manager. And that remains the same. So even as of System Center 2016, the product name is still just System Center Configuration Manager. You hear it referred to generally as current branch, um, just to help provide a little more context to it so you're not confused by the Configuration Manager 2012 and its various formats or Configuration Manager 2007. Now what was included in System Center 2016 for Configuration Manager is a new baseline build of Configuration Manager Current Branch Build 1606. So it's been out since towards the end of July of this year as something that all of you running the Current Branch release from 1511, 1602, you could then update to 1606. And that was again towards the very end of July that it became generally available, even though the code was finished in June. Um, since then, they released a couple of hotfixes, and one of them was the update rollup one hotfix, and I got the KB number on the screen for you. That is also included in this baseline build of Configuration Manager 1606. So this is good news for you guys. So for those of you that are still sitting on, forbid, a Configman 2007 environment, um, or even a Configman 2012 infrastructure, you could now do a migration directly from Configman 2007 or Configman 2012 directly to that baseline build of current branch 1606. So no longer would you have to stand up a brand new 1511 site and then update it to either 1602, then 1606, or more appropriately, 1511, and then skip 1602 and go directly to 1606. So you wouldn't have to do that double installation hop. So install the old baseline 1511 and then update to 1606. Now you can just install the new baseline build 1606 and you're ready to do your migration. For those of you that are on, on Configman 2012, um, one of the supported versions and you want to do an in-place upgrade, which is generally the recommended method to move to current branch from Configman 2012, you can now again directly install and upgrade to current branch 1606. So again, you don't have to go to 
1511 from Config Man 2012, and then do your updates and servicing feature to get to 1606. So a nice, clean, easy installation. And again, that update rollup one hotfix is already included for you. So that's all, that's all good news. Um, it's just no new capabilities here in this build at all. It's directly what you have access to today and you have had access to for a couple of months now. It's just now it's a baseline build. So you can install a brand new site for migration purposes or whatever you need or do an upgrade from supported platforms directly to 1606. So that's all cool, great information. Just makes you um, and great news and just gets you a little bit closer to where you want to be um, with shortening your steps. Now, where things get a little more confusing is that in this same release of Configuration Manager, that baseline bill of 1606, the product group is now releasing and they announced a long-term servicing branch version of Configuration Manager. So it is still the 1606 baseline build. During the upgrade or installation of this baseline build, you'll be prompted, and I've got a slide where I show you the screenshot here momentarily, of whether or not you want to go to the current branch version of Configuration Manager, or you want to go to the long-term servicing branch release. And the long-term servicing branch release, LTSB, should sound familiar to you because you've heard this for years now with Windows 10, with the current branch and long-term servicing branch. So Configuration Manager is kind of keeping the same terminology to make it easier for you to understand what's going on. Now, before you guys get excited about this, uh, we would caution you that as a general rule, you do not want to implement the LTSB version of Configuration Manager. And I think it's on my next slide here. I'll tell you the one scenario where you would want to consider it. But as a general rule, you want to ignore it. But just for your information, this is a very limited functionality release. While it is the 1606 current branch baseline, it does remove some features. So there's some limitations in what you can implement and utilize for this release. For example, most of the features that rely on Microsoft Cloud functionality, such as Intune integration, Windows 10 current branch and current branch for business management, being the Windows 10 servicing node with the dashboard and the servicing plans, the updates and servicing feature to get new updates from, as you guys experienced, from 1511 to 1602 to 1606, um, asset intelligence with its synchronization point, um, cloud distribution points, etc. All those features are not applicable for this long-term servicing branch release of Configuration Manager. There is limited client support and honestly, right now, the clients that are supported with the LTSB release are, in essence, the same clients that you can support with um, the current branch release, with the exception of Windows 10 current branch, current branch for business, but for the most part, the rest of them. However, no new operating systems are expected to be supported going forward. So new versions of Windows Server, new versions of Windows 10, etc. This new version is going to be supported for 10 years without the updates and servicing feature to update it to 1610, 1702, whatever comes in the future. Um, now, there could be security updates for it, but for the most part, it's going to be a 10-year limited support cycle um, and not being that updating every four months as the current branch release is has been doing and is expected to continue doing. So when do you want to consider using this LTSB release? Um, realistically, it's only for customers who, for whatever reason, decide to let their software assurance expire. Um, when you let software assurance expire, legally you must remove your existing installed installation, such as Configuration Manager 2012 SP1. So if you do let that SA benefit expire, then this is a release that you're legally allowed to install and keep running for this 10-year time period. Other than that scenario, I can't think of a reason why you'd want to use the LB LTSB release, and the product group says that's the only reason as well. Now, one cool thing is if you get this build and you're now going to upgrade or do a migration from 2012 or 2007, and you get confused by that page and you choose, yeah, I'm going to do LTSB and you get it installed and bingo, you're off and running and oops, well, I can't do this. I can't do that. That's not there anymore. Um, you do have the ability of converting 
your installation from an LTSB install to a current branch installation provided that you are legally allowed to do so, which means you have software insurance um, rights. So here's that screen where when you're doing a clean install or you're doing an upgrade, um, it's going to ask you these two options down at the bottom, current branch or LTSB. And in this case, I've selected LTSB, which you would not want to do. I actually walked through the installation of an LTSB environment so I could show you what it looks like. Um, you obviously want to stick up here where it says current branch. That's the option you want. And obviously, you have to have your product key. Now, in the middle, you have this option here to set your software assurance expiration date. And that's so you can help track your software assurance and the configuration manager console can notify you when you're getting close to that expiration as a reminder, hey, you need to go out there and renew your software assurance to stay legal with this version of the product. All right, so hopefully that made um, some sense and cleared up if you any um, issues that you might have heard if you had heard of this before. So let me just go over and pop over to my environment. Oops, if I stop moving around and uh, we don't want to go to updates. Um, so this is an LTSB installation that I went through. I actually did it last night because I wanted to try it out um, just to see what the differences were. Um, so it's going to look almost exactly the same as what you're familiar with, either from 2012 or certainly if you've been playing around with the current branch releases. If you go to the help about, you'll see that it does say 1606. So that, because that is the current version of it, and that's what it's going to remain. It's going to remain version 1606, whereas your current branch releases are going to go to 1610, if that's what the next build is, and, and so on. Um, realistically, a couple of different ways you can tell if you're on LTSB release. If you go to administration, the, the definitive way is go to administration, expand site configuration, go to sites, go to your hierarchy settings, and then on hierarchy settings, there's a new tab that you've not had before, the licensing tab. So click on the licensing tab. And if you have this checkbox available to you, um, convert to current branch. That is only available if you're running the LTSB version of Configuration Manager. Um, so if you are installed as LTSB, which I did in this installation, um, you can select the checkbox and it will let you go through a process of converting your environment over. Um, that's realistically the way to tell. Now, other ways you can kind of tell is if you go and try and implement any of those features that are removed, like Microsoft Intune subscription. You see it's still there, but if you try and add one, it pops up with this message saying that this requires a current branch addition of Configuration Manager and tells you where you can go to do your conversion. So if you do that, or like want to implement a cloud distribution point, same thing, it tells you that same message, that this is only available in LTSB release. So. So that's what you got. Um, other than that, it pretty well looks the same. I haven't seen much as far as being really removed. The stuff's still there. It just tells you, hey, you can't use this because you're an LTSB release. So, all righty, that should be enough for that. But as a general rule, again, you don't want to do the LTSB release. So when you get to um, implementing this new baseline build um, and you get to the screen, you want to go ahead and choose the option um, let me go ahead and do it. You want to choose this guy right here, the current branch release, and not the LTSB release, which I did. Um, so you don't want to use this guy. So you ignore him, and instead go to the uh, current branch release. So that's what you want. All righty. With that, um, let's jump over to Kent. And Kent has some discussion he wants to do on enterprise mobility and security. Yeah. And... Um... I'd say it's a really good walkthrough of the LTSB. Um, I mean, we cannot stress out enough that you don't want to go, you don't want to take that route. And it has, in my opinion, it has nothing to do with supporting Windows 10 LTSB at all. Uh, so it is, it is, as you said, Wally, it's, it's only a licensing question, right? Yep. Um, so, <clears throat> okay. So um, we didn't have a, a, a whole lot of things to discuss around. Uh, configuration manager, we did have a lot of stuff we wanted to discuss around configuration manager at Ignite, but as Wally said, there was not a whole lot of sessions there. Uh, what we did see, however, from the um, from the team was uh, some, some sessions around uh, EMS and some of the new things that we will see in the enterprise mobility 
Plus Security Suite because it's not called uh, Enterprise Mobility Suite any longer. It's just Enterprise Mobility Plus Security. Um, I, I have a couple of bullets here, and I have the first one I have is like BYOD comes live, and what I mean with that is. Uh, even though we might have been talking about Intune or Config Manager, MDM, and BYOD for a uh, couple of years, I mean, there is no real true BYOD, in my opinion, if you have to install an agent or if you have to domain join a, a given device, because that's not really, you know, bringing my own device. I've done a lot of uh, projects. Um, uh, MDM projects over the years and one thing I can tell you is that when you get an external person in working at your company he or she do not want your Intune agent uh, on their iPhone or Android phone or whatever uh, they have. Uh, so some of the changes and I'm going to show you those uh, allows for what I would call uh, true BYOD. Then um, one of the, the new features that they also announced was conditional access for applications. So those of you who are familiar with, um, with conditional access, you know the, 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 the common scenario is that, okay, if your Windows 10 laptop or your Surface or whatever Windows 10 device you have um, is not compliant with the health at station policies that we have, you know, it's not encrypted, it's not using UEFI and so on, then we'll deny you access to our company resources such as SharePoint, uh, Skype for Business, and, and uh, maybe most important, uh, Mail. Now we can, we can do the same for applications. It's not live yet. Uh, I do, however, have, a, uh, I do have um, that enabled in my tenant so I can show you. So the whole purpose here is that um, for from, from Mail applications, and that's really a challenge in my opinion, in the mobile world, um, I want to be able to control the mail app. Uh, so, for instance, I want to be able to control the Outlook application. Uh, but controlling the Outlook application doesn't really do me any good if my uh, all of my users are using one of the native mail applications on their device to read corporate email. Um, so, in that scenario, you know, I'm, I'm securing Outlook, but they don't care because they're using another app. Um, then we have Android for Work. Android, Android for Work was announced. It's it's still in a what we will call a public preview. Uh, Android is interesting. I do not know if you're aware of um, the many different Android uh, variants we have out there, but it's 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 24,000 plus different uh, Android variants we have. So when when you say, hey, I want to do a BYOD scenario then potentially you're looking at your users bringing in 24,000 plus different versions of Android. I mean, there is, there, is, there is no way we can support them. There is no way that Microsoft or any other MDM vendor uh, can go in and, and you know, make sure that your, your mail configuration works on all of those devices and your, you know, your managed app configuration works on all of those devices and so on. So what Android have is that they have a framework called Android for Work, and it has been uh, it has been supported by some of the other vendors for years. So that's kind of um, you know when when we have Android for Work, we have a, a a specific container on that device, and and we can control that container. And you know that experience when we control the container will always be the same. Not all Android devices will support Android for Work, but now when I do it, when I'm doing my BYOD scenario, I can say, well, we do support iOS, we do support Windows Phone, and we do support all Android devices that support Android for work. So, you know, I don't believe in a true BYOD because that's simply too difficult to manage. Um, so I, I see a distinguish a distinguish between you know BAD, bring any device, and then bring your own device. Um, one of the other things we have is uh, Lookout integration, uh, and if you if you missed that announcement, uh, Lookout, uh, who is a uh, a Boston-based security company, um, are now allowing integration with with Intune. So what Lookout will do is they will have an agent installed on your mobile device, and that agent will then look for vulnerabilities. And yes, we do have vulnerabilities on Android devices. That's 
probably not news to you, but we also have vulnerabilities on our iOS devices. And um, one one uh, kind of funny story when we talk about vulnerabilities here is uh, most of you probably know uh, uh, Pokemon Go. Um, when Pokemon Go was um, announced and released as an app, it was only released, I believe, in three countries. So it wasn't released in, in, in I don't think it was released in any of the countries here in Europe. So what we saw within the first 24 hours was a lot of APK files. So those would be, you know, Android, uh, downloaded Android applications that would just, you know, they would replicate on servers all over the world. Um, and some of them also found their way into the Google Play Store. But the thing is, five, at least five of those um, Pokemon Go applications were completely infected by malware. So when, 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 not when I installed it because I yet have I haven't done that yet. <laughs> but uh, but when you know when you install one of those uh, false Pokemon to Go uh, apps on your on your Android device, well there you go. I mean your your phone was compromised. Um, they could go in, check your uh, corp credentials and what have you. So. The Lookout con uh, integration here is conditional access again, and when we when we have the integration, the Lookout uh, client will inform Intune, the Intune service, that hey, there is something suspicious going on on this device, and then the conditional access will uh, immediately block for uh, for access to uh, to email and other uh, call credentials. And um, well, if you can make me a presenter, then I can. And I will go in and... That I can do... Um, which one? You're listed twice. <laughs> I am? <laughs> yes. Uh, okay, well, I just made uh, one of you a presenter, so... Um. Let's see, and yep, so I can show my screen. Oh, there we got you. Good. Okay, so you, you have me here. Okay, so... Um, Let's see here. Let me bring up one of the Android devices here. <clears throat> so here I have my uh, one of my uh, Android devices, and uh, just went black on me. Uh, <clears throat> but when I'm when I'm when I'm creating the policy, it will automatically go in and uh, download and install the Lookout uh, application. It will do that automatically for Android. For iOS right now, I will have to go into the App Store and, 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 and get it, but I know that they are working on that. So uh, the Lookout integration here just works. So if I go into my Play Store, and in my Play Store, um, if you <laughs> this, this application here, I'm not going to install that, but this specific application, I just know that uh, it's um, it's malware. So it's it's funny. I mean, I know Lookout have already told uh, the Google Play Store that uh, that this one here is infected, but they haven't removed it yet. Uh, I'm not going to install that one. I'm going to install one of the uh, demo apps instead. So those of you who have been playing around with Definition and Antivirus, you probably are aware of um, the iCar applications. So when I when I install this application here. And when I try to open the application, uh, you'll see my Lookout virus alert. So, so the Lookout already now detects that hey, <clears throat> this this looks like a virus, and then it will prompt me to uninstall this application. I can keep the app if I want to, but that would just make my device uh, uh, non-compliant, and the normal compliance policy will then you know uh, kick in removing access to uh, to mail and so on and so forth so now I'll just go ahead and, and, and uninstall um, this one here instead and then I'll move in to uh, to the web portion of it so first of all look out here uh, is, is not part of Intune it integrates into Intune but it's a third-party vendor uh, so just just like Sirison, I mean these guys here are adding value to your uh, to your mobile device management investment. In in here you will have uh, threats. So I'll be able to see here what threats are uh, just occurred, and this is the uh, this is the threat that just occurred right now. Uh, I was signed in as uh, Kenny, and 7:33 p.m. 
that's my local time. Uh, I can also, I mean, I can, I have a, an overview of my my devices in here, and then I have the policy. So the policy is where I go in and define, you know, uh, a, a malicious activity. What is that? Is that high, low, medium, and so on? So this is where you would go in um, as administrator and define your, uh, your your risk level. Once you have done that, then uh, in Intune. When you go to your policy, let me just re-authenticate here. So when I go to my, my compliance policy in just a few seconds, um, <clears throat> you'll see that there is a change in the uh, in the compliance policy. If you're all new to uh, to to Intune, then a compliance policy uh, contains the rules that you know my my device have to. Uh, adhere to, otherwise we will remove uh, access to, to call data here. There we go. So here I'll go into my compliance policy and in my compliance policy I already I did create one I call device uh, threat protection and the only thing I have enabled in here um, is my device health. So, so this is this is where I go in and configure the um, the integration, or not the integration, but the, uh, the 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 threat level that I get that I get back from uh, from Lookout. So I've said, well, I don't really care about the threat level. Uh, if we get anything back, uh, then uh, then we'll uh, you know disable access to our, our corporate data there. So this is interesting in um, in two for two reasons. First off, it's to me it's super interesting because <clears throat> now what we see is uh, Intune for the first time is actually opening up for for, uh, for third-party vendors, and I kind of like that because this is this is uh, you know uh, one of the, one of the really good things about SCCM is all the integration that you can do with 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 that specific product. That has, in my opinion, really increased the adoption and the market value of that product. And when we start seeing the same with Intune, uh, I mean, just imagine what some of the uh, the, the developers at Sirison can come up with. Um, so I'm I'm really looking forward to to this part here. I also mentioned that we have uh, Android for Work, and Android for Work. Uh, right now, it's probably not enabled in your tenant. Uh, this is a uh, preview program that you can sign up to, but once you have Android for Work in here, you will notice that I can go in and create specific policies. Uh, so if I go in and create um, a configuration policy, I can create a specific policy here um, for Android for Work. So these, these policies will end up in the Android for Work container, and um, in here, the, for instance, part of the stuff that I want to configure is I don't want to allow any any of my uh, work uh, data to be mixed between the Android for Work container and your personal uh, data. So, so, so that would be some of the reasons why I want to create a custom uh, profile in here. When you when you do get the Android for Work container installed, and I have that on another device, so. Let me just switch to this device here. Two seconds. You should see my other device here. So here, what you can see is I have uh, when I when I got Android for Work uh, enrolled here on this device, I got a container here called Work, and I don't know if you can see it, but there is a, a, an icon in here. So all of this stuff that I have in here is uh, encrypted, and I am unable to share information between my files that are my work files and then my my personal files. So you know stuff like uh, copying and pasting and so on and so forth. Um, it's not possible. So let's just get rid of that one here. Um, <clears throat> another thing that I that I mentioned was the real BYOD. So to me, real BYOD, a real bring your own device, comes when we can protect the uh, the applications that we have installed on a device. So for instance. 
I know some of the consultants uh, coming in to our organizations who are not, you know, Cortic consultants. We want to make sure that they get access to uh, their email account on their mobile devices. But I, I'm not the one installing the application. So what they can do is, we, they can go in, and then they can just sign in to Outlook using their credentials. And what, what we have done is we have created what is called a MAM policy, a managed application policy. So I've created a couple in here. Um, and these policies here, they only have kind of one goal, and that is to protect the data. So when I look at the policy settings, you'll see here uh, allow app to transfer data to other apps, uh, only policy managed apps. Um, so I, I will go in and, and protect the data in here and also say I, I don't want, I'm not allowing you to save your data on your device. Uh, and one more thing that I really uh, have been waiting for personally is the offline uh, interval in here. So what is, what is the number of days that you will have to be offline on this specific device before your data is wiped? Um, I, I hear I have one day, uh, default is, uh, I believe it's 28. Um, so, so what happens here and what I've done here is I've allowed my users to go in on any iOS device that they might have or Android device and then, you know, just sign in uh, to, for instance, Outlook uh, using uh, our corporate account and then we will protect all of that data in, uh, in Outlook. Let me just quickly let me just quickly show you that. So I'll bring up my, my iPhone here. So there you go. So here you'll see you have um, you have my iPhone and just to show you um, I don't I don't have any it's not enrolled, so I, I mean I don't have the Intune client uh, installed at all here. When I go into Outlook, this is uh, my personal um, email account, and uh, when I go to settings down here, I can go in and add a new account. So I'll just go ahead and add a new email account, and this account now I'm Kevin. So just go ahead and add Kevin here. Uh, now, now Outlook discovers because it supports uh, multiple identities. It's, it actually uh, discovers that Kevin is uh, protected by my uh, my MAM policy. So what it's going to do now is it's going to enforce a policy that I have saying, "Hey, um, we're going to restart the application." And uh, we will also force you to set up a um, a pin code, or it could be uh, you know your thumbprint or whatever. Um, so now, when I restart my Outlook app, I actually have multiple accounts in here, and I'm protecting. So here you go, 2604. So good that you know your birthday is only six characters. Um, so now. <clears throat> in a few seconds here, I should be able to see Kevin's mail, and here you go. So this is Kevin's mail, and if I uh, go in and copy some of the information, let's just go ahead and select everything. Select all, copy, and then I go, then I go back to all accounts here and create a new mail. So I'm going to send Wally a mail, and I'm going to share some secret stuff with Wally. Um, cool, I'm you'll excited. See, <laughs> you'll see here that I hope you are watching the recording because I'm, not, I'm, I'm, I'm unable to paste the information here. So just notice I have select and select all. The reason for that is I'm using my personal account. So if I if I go in here and change this to my uh, corp account, and then after that. I can go ahead, you know, and send the information. Uh, so this is this is what I this is what I call a true BYOD scenario because I can have a mobile Iron uh, MDM agent installed here, 
and uh, I mean I'm not enrolled in Intune, but I'm still the, the 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 applications that I use are still controlled by our company. So the only thing we worry about is access to corporate data. Uh, so I'm, I'm I mean this is still this is the new Azure portal. It's still in uh, still in preview, but um, hopefully we'll we'll start seeing this in in production. Um, in, uh, in in Q1, I don't believe that they mentioned um, that they mentioned any release dates there, but but hopefully uh, we are going to see that very soon. Yeah, so those were uh, those were some of the uh, the new stuff um, that they mentioned uh, at, at Ignite around uh, at, around EMS so Lookout, Android for work support, uh, MAM for uh, unenrolled devices. Um, yeah, super excited. Uh, you want to switch it back to you, Wally? I will do that, and I am still waiting for that email with that super secret stuff to come into my inbox. Um, yeah, yeah. I guess I'm going to be waiting for a while. <laughs> I think I think it's actually out there somewhere in cyberspace, but there's a long uh, way from Copenhagen to Seattle. It is. It is, and probably the rain's slowing it down too. So. Anywho, alrighty. Well, very great. That's fantastic. A um, lot of cool things in there. Um, so let's go ahead and finish this up. We're down to our last 15 minutes. So um, what I wanted to do to finish up our presentation is um, something else. This didn't come as part of Ignite because it happened um, shortly after Ignite, but it was um, Microsoft released the new technical preview release 1609 of the Configuration Manager current branch. Um, and I wanted to spend a few minutes on this because there's one specific thing in there that I know is going to be impacting you guys very, very soon. Um, and as with all technical previews, these are glimpses of what may be included in, if not the next, or certainly some point in time, production build a configuration manager current branch. Now, obviously, the LTSB release that we talked about, you're not going to see these things coming up because there's been no updates as far as features to it. But um, anyway, this is what's in technical preview 1609, which again came out, I think it was the week, either the very end of the week of Ignite or the week after, I don't remember now, um, when it became available. So some of the updates that are available to you, um, integration with Windows Upgrade Analytics. So that's a kind of a cool thing. It lets you go ahead and install a, um, a hotfix on your Windows 7 and later devices, allowing this um, online service to collect status about your um, current implementations, then you can then do reporting for the upgradability of those Windows 7, 8, 8.1 systems up to Windows 10, and that information appears in your config man um, console. So kind of cool, because that's where you're managing all your clients from anyway. Additional Windows Store for business integration features. So previously, you could only um, deploy free apps from the Windows Store for business. Now you can go ahead and do purchased apps. Um, you can also force a sync of the sync between the two different services between Config Manager as well as Windows Store for Business. Some new endpoint protection updates allow you to designate risky computers, those have had certain malware events or a certain number of malware events that have happened, as well as some controls over blocking suspicious files. Some additional settings available to you for Apple device enrollment protocol or program. Um, so you can go ahead and do some more controls there. Uh, they increase the number of devices any single user could enroll in the um, hybrid scenario integration with, with Microsoft Intune from 5 to 15 devices. Um, I don't know how many devices Kent has, but most of us don't have 15 devices, but um, 5 was fine for a lot of us, but some of you younger people are, are used to having a whole lot of things in your pockets and having them all filled. I think this, this, this setting here is mainly for people who are testing. Yeah, yeah, yes, um, yes. All right, um, some additional VPN profile types for hybrid enrolled Windows 10 devices, so some of those built-in profile types that you had for VPNs and, and the on-prem scenarios for clients. Um, some Intune compliance charts, so now trying to get some of that integration, as Kent was talking about, from Intune into your configuration manager environment. Uh, a whole screen, maybe two or three screens worth of new compliance settings for iOS and Androids and Macs and Windows 10 and Windows 8.1 and some phone devices, uh, Windows Phone as well. So a lot of new compliance settings there. Office 365 client management dashboard. Um, so you've, you've heard me talk about Office 365 integration in previous webinars and they're expanding that now to give you a dashboard of what your um, integration looks like. 
uh, number of clients you have and the versions of them and status and so on, but also giving you the ability of launching off some actions from your dashboard, creating ADRs to deploy some office apps and so on. So cool. Um, Kent mentioned UEFI in one of his scenarios. Um, so there's some improvements in operating system deployment for the BIOS to UEFI conversions. The ability of, in your task sequences now to specify a partition you want to use is that staging partition as you're migrating or converting from um, BIOS to UEFI. And that's got a lot of different pages in there showing you all a bunch of different screenshots. But what I really wanted to concentrate on as I think this may be hitting um, the next production release is some changes in boundary group functionality and management. Um, so this is going to be important for everybody because you're all utilizing Configuration Manager and you're all familiar with the boundary group functionality. And this is going to be changing. If, if it doesn't make 1610 or whatever the next release is, production release, um, certainly will be shortly after that. So. Um, so the definition of fast and slow distribution point connections is now being removed. So no longer when you add a DP to a boundary group are you going to designate whether its connection to that distribution point is via fast link or slow link. There's no more configuration of a fallback distribution point. So you used to be able to designate on um, your deployments as well as on DPs and so on, whether it was going to be a fallback scenario or not. They're now going to create a brand new distribution point group called default site boundary group with your three character site code on it uh, that kind of replaces this fallback configuration as I'll we'll talk about. So what's going to happen now is you're going to create boundary groups and set those boundary groups to have relationships amongst other boundary groups. So what you'll do is you'll designate for boundary group one, let's assume that's where my current clients are, and you'll, you'll manage your boundary groups the same way as far as the boundaries that you have associated with them, as well as your distribution points. But now what you're going to state is that this boundary group now has a relationship with this other boundary group. Um, and you can set up multiple different relationships um, from your current boundary group to what these other ones that are now called neighbor boundary groups. And this is to allow you to provide additional distribution points that clients can access when they can't find a distribution point in their current boundary group or maybe some other neighbor boundary group that they're going to talk to. And I'll explain that momentarily here. You can also configure the time delay before a client tries DPs in neighbor boundary groups or the default site boundary group. And I'll show you what that looks like. So um, let me go ahead and show you in the code what this looks like in some of these changes. Um, so this is 1609. Um, so while Kent was doing his demonstration, I booted up a different set of images. Um, and this is my technical preview, 1609. Um, so again, you don't have this in production builds yet, so you wouldn't see this in your 1511, 1602, 1606 environment. Um, you'd only see this from a technical preview environment. Um, so it's 1609. And all those other features I talked about, if you go to the What's New um, tab, it shows you all those things. So here's some of those additional settings we talked about. Here's a discussion about boundary groups and Office 365 apps and um, compliance charts, you can track all those things inside the what's new node. But for this specific conversation with the time we have left, go to boundary groups. And now you see in an upgrade scenario, because I did an upgrade from a previous version of the product, um, I think it was 1606 is where I was at, um, to 1609. Um, I had a boundary group here called local clients and TPS. TPS is my site code, technical preview site. I'm pretty. Um, that's as logical as I could get. Um, in the upgrade scenario, it tried to preserve what I had, so it's taking all the site systems that I had in my existing boundary group and dropping them into a default built-in boundary group for TPS. So if I go look at the properties here, you'll see that that one has a reference and it's my one distribution point I have available to me. So now let me go ahead and create a new boundary group um, for reference. Uh, local DPs in CPH. So that'll be in Copenhagen. 
And let me just always go ahead and add in um, something I would never do, default first site name, but just so something unique. And I could go in there and add in a, uh oh Every once in a while, you'll get those with a um, technical preview environment. Um, you get a exception. So let's see if that, okay, saved it. Doesn't matter anyway. Um, so now, um, what the new scenario is, you'll create your appropriate boundary groups. You'll put your DPs and boundaries and, and bound, uh, distribution points in those boundary groups. And now what you'll do is when you go to your boundary group on your references tab, you used to be able to designate that um, the DPs were in fast or slow connections, and you can't do that anymore. Instead, you now have this new tab at the top called relationships. So now in my boundary group here for local clients and TPS, go to the relationships tab. And now I'm going to go ahead and add my boundary, my local DPs and CPH. But notice what you have available to you is you can now specify your fallback time um, before clients in the existing boundary group, which in my case, local clients and TPS, before they'll fall back to looking at DPs in this new boundary group, which is considered a neighbor boundary group, local clients and CPH. So, um, so you create your appropriate boundary groups. You can have boundary groups for your remote DP locations, so places where you have pockets of clients that you want to have local content management. So you put D DPs out there, you have a boundary group. So for now, ignore um, management point and software update point. Um, the product group has those in there, so you can assume in the future you're going to be able to bind your software update points to boundary groups. You can already bind your management points to um, boundary groups um, in current branch. But ignore those for now for this discussion. Um, right in the initial release, they're stating it's only going to work for distribution points. So what you're going to state here is that when my clients which again are in the boundary group, local clients and TPS, they're going to search each available distribution point in their current boundary group as, as the terminology is, local clients and TPS, if they're in that boundary. Um, so they're a part of that boundary group. They're gonna search all the DPs in there. They'll try each DP randomly for two minutes. If it can't connect and find that content in two minutes, it's gonna go for another distribution point in that boundary group. And it's going to go through all those distribution points in that boundary group until it expires all of them and it reaches a time value. So in this case, let me go ahead and drop this guy from 120 minutes. Let me just drop him down to 10. And I'll zoom back in for you. So now what's going to happen is my clients that are in my current boundary group, local clients and TPS, they're going to try all my DPs for up to 10 minutes. And if they can't find any co the content on any of my DPs within 10 minutes, they're going to then fall back to the distribution points in this neighbor boundary group, local DPs and CPH, after that 10-minute cycle. And then they'll cycle through all the distribution points in the Copenhagen distribution point group. If I have another relationship set up to another neighbor boundary group, um, I could have a different time frame, let's say 30 minutes. So after a total of 30 minutes of searching the current boundary group and my neighbor boundary groups, it'll fall back to this third boundary group to look for distribution points. Um, so it's allowing you to control how long your client's gonna check the current boundary group, as well as in which order the DPs in your neighboring boundary groups are gonna be utilized before it falls back to those. And obviously you're gonna have the more fast, closely connected or high speed connected ones with a shorter fallback time frame. And those that are over longer distances or slower connections, we have a longer fallback period before they fall back. And obviously you have the checkbox here where you can say, no, I don't want you to ever fall back to the boundary, uh, to the DPs in this boundary group. Um, and then there's going to be the um, default site boundary group, which is kind of like your all any DPs that are not in any other boundary group, what used to be kind of like your fallback distribution points. Um, those will, by default, have a 120-minute timeout value on them. So after two hours of searching, 
it would fall back to DPs that you have in your default site group, um, site code boundary group. Um, so again, ignore the management point, software update point. They'll eventually get them in, but they're stating that in the first production release, it's it's only going to be supported for distribution points, even though the UI might still show the management point and software update point. So there's um, um, if you go to the TechNet site and you go to the um, what's new in technical preview 1609, um, it does go through quite an exhaustive um, recap on the changes, fast, slow, fallback, over into these relationships between current and neighboring and the timing, timeout values you can specify here for fallback and how those all work together. So this is something that I would highly recommend you guys, if you don't already have a technical preview site set up, that you may very well want to set up a technical preview site, get it updated to 1609 so you can start playing around with this in your labs because you know technical previews are very, very small in size as far as number of clients you can have and so on. So play around with it, get familiar with it because this is going to be coming in um, a future production release. And it may very well happen in the next production release, which we're guessing is going to be 1610. Um, so you do need to get uh, aware of it because it is going to change how things operate. But again, the documentation's there to get you started on it. And it talks about the upgrade scenario and how it created this default built-in boundary group for TPS um, and discussion about the fallback timing and so on. Um, that was what I was going to show you on TP1609. Um, anything else to add there, Kent? Uh, just the, the branch ca cache integration, maybe. Um, so as, as you probably know with the, uh, with the feature updates coming out uh, to Windows 10, and also with the Office 365 updates coming out and the quality updates coming out, we're looking at maybe a one gigabyte by download per client uh, per month. So if you don't have any peer-to-peer -peer, uh, caching technology, um, then at least you should go in and utilize the, uh, the branch cache technology. And one of the new things in, uh, in TP609 is that besides configuring branch cache, we can actually now in a dashboard see so how much of our content came from branch cache, how much come, came from uh, Windows PE peer caching, and how, how much content were downloaded from the distribution point. So that's, those, those, those parts are also super interesting. I'm not. I'm. I'm a bit unsure if it will make it into the 1610 build, uh, but but at least you need to go. You need to go. You know, start your branch cache uh, adventure right now. That's important. Yeah, and there's also um, um, in one of the other uh, tech preview builds. I think it's still there. Is um, the configuration manager is going to have its own client cache functionality as well. So there's lots of different functionalities, whether it's config man client cache, whether it's branch cache, whether it's third party vendors. 1E, Adaptiva, or others to help you in this management of your cache, because as Kent says, these these updates to um, your Windows 10 environment, they're getting to be big. I um, mean, you want to make sure that oh, you yeah. have control <laughs> over those and, and how that's flowing around your infrastructure. So, Yeah, and especially, I mean, as I mentioned, especially with the uh, cumulative updates coming out now, I just I just uh, approved a couple of uh, CUs in, in my production environment last week, and we're looking at uh, 1.1 gigabytes uh, per client, so that's, I mean, that's a, a massive amount of traffic that we have to download. Yep, yep, so being able to control that and doing peer-to-peer -peer is going to be a great solution for you to help you in, um, in that WAN management, so cool, okay. Um, then that is it as far as what we had for our slides for you guys. So just as a real quick summary, um, so if you weren't aware, hopefully you were, the System Center 2016 is now generally available, so you can go to the Volume License Servicing Center or MSDN, the Tech Center Evaluation site to download the appropriate builds for you. Um, this does provide a new baseline build of Configuration Manager Current Branch 1606. As part of that, you do have the ability of installing the long-term servicing branch, which do not do. Um, we can't stress it enough. Um, you don't <laughs> want to do that unless you do exp let your software assurance expire. Then legally, you have to um, get rid of what you had, and this is an option for you. There's lots of updates, as Kent talked about, in the enterprise mobility and security space, conditional access for your apps. Great, cool way of, of controlling 
your email access. Um, Android iOS updates for that, um, Android for, for work, um, multi-factor authentication um, updates and so on. So lots of cool things there happening if you're in the mobile space. Um, technical Preview 1609 includes lots of different updates that may make production at some point in time and some of them very likely will, you know, 1606, there's been now 1607, 1608, and 1609. So there's three different monthly updates of things that could happen in the next production update, which again, we're assuming is 1610, but we don't know, uh, but these, um, changes to boundary groups that I just talked about real quickly are expected to begin in the next production release, at least that's the expectation, so uh, uh, you want to be prepared for those. So I'd be looking at the TechNet docs on that and play around with the uh, technical preview site if you haven't already done so, because um, it's great information to be prepared for. Um, so if you're not familiar with this, the Cyrusing community, we have our own forum, so kind of like the TechNet forums, it's more designated specifically for System Center and the Cyrusing solutions. So you can certainly go there and join that and contribute or ask questions there, uh, including just on Configuration Manager as necessary. And then look for some new things coming up from Cyrus and soon, and I'm sure Cortex is going to have some new things coming up as well. Um, at IT Dev last week, we did announce um, a brand new um, web console. Um, so we are going to be providing a web experience for Configuration Manager administration. So. We announced that, and I've got a webinar um, will be coming up next month. I'll, I'll give you more information on that. Um, so we expect to release that by the end of the year and updates, a um, couple of different updates in the Q1 of next year or so. If you need help with your deployment migration upgrade needs for System Center Configuration Manager, you can contact us or certainly contact um, Kent's team at Cortec, and, and they can help you out with that, whatever is appropriate for you. So with that let's go look and see what we have for questions in the queue there um, let me go to questions and pop that guy out nothing we were so clear that you guys don't have any questions at all wow that would be a so first that, time ever uh, i think maybe or, we were just muted all the way oh that could be too we were muted nobody <laughs> heard a thing if so i would guess there'd be questions saying uh hey i can't hear a thing um, I actually did a webinar one time. I got seven minutes into it before somebody let me know that I was muted. Um, so I had to start the whole thing over for the recording. But um, at least they did let me finally let me know. Um, and luckily, it was a it was a person at Cyrus, and so he had presenter rights, so he could unmute and tell me that. Uh, but he, for whatever reason, waited seven minutes. So, oh, oh, oh okay. Uh, just thanks for the good info. Okay. Um, so no real questions. Well, well, that is great. So again, the recording. Oh, okay. Can you show the Office 365 dashboard? Um, I don't have anything configured in mine. Do you have anything in yours to sh that you can show there, Kent? I am just um, I'm just looking. Just give me two seconds here uh, because I'm not sure I have. Um, so Greg was looking to see the Office 365 dashboard, but. Um, like I said, I don't. I've not played around with it. Um, I mean, I can show you where the dashboard is, and I don't. But I don't think there's anything in there of any worthwhile. Get my Q and A out of the way. I do have some data here. I just don't have any Office 365 clients. Uh, so if you wanna, I can. I can. Uh, if I can just become a presenter, Wally. Okay. Sure, um, if you got something there you want to show, that's fine. So you should see my screen here. So as, yep. as I mentioned, as I, I do see my Office 365 updates because I'm, uh, I'm, I'm synchronizing those. And then, I mean, look at, look at this just like uh, you're looking at your Windows 10 servicing because that's mm -hmm. kind of... I mean, it's kind of kind of the same to me. And uh, as I mentioned, in this environment here, I don't have I don't have any uh, O365 clients. But you can see here, I I can create an automatic deployment rule and and, and so on and so forth. And the while I'm while I am here, uh, some of the other dash dashboards that Wally mentioned would be the upgrade analytics. That's super interesting as well uh, when we're doing migration projects, and then also the client data sources. So this this is the uh, dashboard that we also mentioned, where you can see here. So who is the, from where did you distribute your content? So after I I enabled uh, my branch caching, then you can see on my toolkit package that I deployed. I mean, uh, most of this came from from branch cache, and and that's that's 
really, really important when we uh, when we set up branch cache. I mean, it's important that we are able to monitor this. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so there's also that, the, at the very bottom you have the software updates um, dashboard as well, which I think I've showed before, previously. But these are all dashboards that the product group is working on. Um, uh, obviously, software updates dashboard I think came in 1604 or five, so it's been out there for a long time, um, but just wasn't ready for the 1606 update. So these are type of things that the product group is working on, and this is where the technical preview builds are really valuable because you can start playing around with these and influence the product groups. Um, development of these telling them well yeah the colors don't work because I'm colorblind or this dashboard doesn't make sense the way it's displayed and you can provide that feedback back to the product group and that helps them determine whether when they're ready to make these prime time to go into a production release so um, so you have a lot of new dashboards coming out the client data sources um, the upgrade analytics um, the one he's showing right now, the Windows Defender ATP status that I know you should spend some time talking about in the last webinar we did together a couple months yep. ago, um, and software updates and, and um, Office 365. So a lot of cool things coming. So that's where the, again, the, um, the technical previews are really cool because they do give you that ability of looking at new things and playing around with them, getting prepared for your own environment, but also then giving that feedback back to the product group whether or not you think that they're ready for prime time to release these things. So so hopefully that helped Greg with that little bit there. But yeah, neither of us had any O365 stuff there to um, really um, show anything worthwhile for you. All right, I see nothing else in the queue. I'll wait for another minute and see if anybody else has any other questions. If not, I um, um, want to thank you guys all for your time. Again, the recording will be, I'll, I'll get it converted over and then uploaded to our internal site. And then Melanie will go ahead and get it posted up to the Vimeo site. I'm sure if not today, tomorrow, but um, and it's already Thursday, I guess, and normally we do these on Wednesday. So, <laughs> so yeah, probably tomorrow it'll be up, um, if not certainly on Monday. Um, so you'll be able to get the recording and go back through and just listen to our, our bright, smiley voices again or view the demos um, for the information. Um, so again, thank you for your time. Hopefully you found it worthwhile. You guys all have a fantastic rest of your day. Kent, thanks for joining us again. It's always a pleasure okay. and hopefully you get feeling better. Um, so oh, thanks yeah. for the great demos and information. And you guys have a fantastic day. I'll hang on to the line just for another minute and see if anybody else pops in with any other questions. And then I'll just go ahead and close this out. And I'll go ahead and stop the recording now. And you guys have a fantastic rest of your day and see you next time. Thanks all. Yeah, bye-bye.